Thank you, Luis. Luis, through a donor, has been able to provide me with this microphone thing that goes on my head, which makes me think of my grandmother, since she used to operate an actual switchboard with the plugging in of the phone calls and the whole business helped to keep the family going during the Great Depression. So is this microphone working well? Can everyone hear me all right? Oh, that's excellent. Good. I see Susan Allen. Hello, Susan. Good to see you. It's somewhat ironic my trying to try on yet another form of technology today, since we are just drifting into the Middle Ages at the beginning of our consideration, which was characterized by the fact that because of the withdrawal of the Roman Empire from the West, medieval culture emerged, and it emerged as a result of a loss of the technologies of governance and also some other basic technologies that had been used in Roman cities, such as running water and sewage disposal. The Middle Ages, curiously, were for that reason a time of experimentation. And so we'll see at the beginning an example of how productive that experimentation could be in the case of Hildegard of Bingen. And then having done that, we'll turn to a very different case in Spain several hundred years later on the cusp of the modern period. And what we'll see in the case of Ines Esteban is that modernity had its very vicious aspects. And it was in the midst of that, specifically the Spanish Inquisition, that Ines Esteban emerged as a prophetic figure. Both the cases of Hildegard and Ines come as a surprise to many historians, and they also instance cases of women who, by means of their faith, are able to discover powerful agency within their environments. In each case, I've been especially interested in identifying where they derive their particular kind of faith from. And it's for this reason that I've put together the handout of the day, which I'll just try to share with you so that we can see some of their characteristic positions and how they understood their own work to have developed. There we go, I think that should have shared now. Uh, and I should be able to click below here so that we get into some of Hildegard's own statement. As you would see, she was born at the very close of the 11th century and lived well in, lived a long time into the 12th century and is especially interesting because at a time when the hierarchy of the church where it concerned clergy was entirely male, Hildegard nonetheless emerged as the abbess, the equivalent of a male abbot of the monastic house near Bingen, which was actually called Rupertsburg. Rupertsburg was so small, she's called Hildegard of Bingen. She began her work as a contemplative when she was in her teens. And she started her work with just one other woman whose name was Yuta. And together, their life of contemplation centered around a reading of the Psalms, the scriptures, and physical work. Uh, she pursued that task and eventually learned how to read. Uh, she became quite skilled in Latin, although largely self-taught. And throughout the course of her life, she describes a series of visions. Uh, those visions came to be written down. 
uh, both in books uh, and also uh, in her correspondence with many other people of the time. They are also provided with commentary uh, by Hildegard herself. And as a result of that, she became extremely well known as a visionary, also as a composer, and interestingly, as a botanist. Uh, her sketches of uh, plant life in Germany are still used to this time. One of the visions she explains in a letter that she wrote to another abbot, she had a vision of a young woman holding the sun and the moon. And she explains that when she saw this vision, she also heard a voice which said, the girl whom you see is divine love who abides eternity. For when God wished to create the world, he bent down in tenderest love and foresaw every need, just like a father preparing an inheritance for his son. In this way, he carries out all his works in a great burning fire of love. Thus, all creatures in every species and form acknowledge their creator, because love was the primal stuff from which every creature was made. When God said, let it be done, it was done because divine love was the matrix from which every creature was made in the blink of an eye. One of the most important features of this statement is Hildegard's conviction as a result of her vision and its explanation that the material world itself belongs to God, that love is the primal stuff. Materiality is not a mistake. In this orientation, Hildegard is taking a different direction from the theology of her time. During the course of most of the 12th century, Christianity was still devoted to the philosophy known as Platonism, according to which this world in which we live is basically corrupt, so constitutionally decayed that it's really only in the ideal world that you can talk about truth. This was not Hildegard's position. Her position was everything as it is was so intended by God, and in addition, as you see repeated here, intended by God in terms of divine love, which is intended for people. This very interesting phrase she has, God foresaw every need, just like a father preparing an inheritance for his son, doesn't mean Christ, right? It means preparing an inheritance for people who are understood to be children of this divine love. The force of Hildegard's vision was so great that it was actually endorsed within its own period by religious leaders. That is, she was seen as being an authentic visionary. And as a result of the impact of her own visions, I have spent some time reflecting on what the sources were which brought her to this point. Remember, she's not a scholar. She learns Latin relatively late in life. She clearly has a deep scriptural understanding, which comes of the life of contemplation. But in addition to that, Hildegard, as in the case of Ines, which we'll see in just a little bit, is influenced by works not commonly known. Uh, in this case, by a work called The Wisdom of Solomon, which you will find in today's Apocrypha, as it's called. Uh, the Apocrypha consists of works that were part of the scriptures of Israel used in the Greek language. So Wisdom of Solomon is Greek language text probably written in Greek, 
But if you lived in the world of the Mediterranean basin and you attended synagogue in the ancient period, you would be familiar with the wisdom of Solomon alongside works that are in Hebrew. At one point, wisdom of Solomon insists the beginning of wisdom is the desire of truest instruction and thought for instruction is love. Love is keeping her laws, attention to laws, basis of immortality. I'd suggest that Hildegard represents a conviction of what words of that kind mean, and that she's familiar with the wisdom of Solomon, poetic work, uh, not only because it's written, but also because it belongs to the oral and prophetic tradition of the Middle Ages. This emphasis upon wisdom that Hildegard represents also comes to open expression in one of her published works. Uh, by the way, I've given the names of translators uh, in the handout. If anyone wishes to look at the works from which they came so that you could read more about Hildegard, please just send me a message and uh, I, can, I can let you know that, that uh, reference. Oh, energy of wisdom, you circled, circling, encompassing all things in one path possessed of life. Three wings you have, one of them soars on high, the second exudes from the earth, and the third flutters everywhere. Uh, in this, Hildegard is representing one of the most basic presuppositions of the wisdom tradition, namely that wisdom, for which the Hebrew word is chokhmah, is the counterpart of ruach, of spirit. That spirit works at the beginning of creation and always shaping and designing. Wisdom is presented in the book of Proverbs, for example, as being alongside God at the very beginning of creation as the divine architect. And this conception is also used in the same work I refer to in the Wisdom of Solomon, which I think explains why Hildegard here speaks of the three wings of wisdom because the wisdom of Solomon says, wisdom is more mobile than motion. She extends and fills with purity since she is God's sublime power, radiance of the Almighty's sheer glory. As a result of that conviction, Hildegard was able to extend a very active engagement with those around her in the contemplative life for what was especially for the time and especially long and productive period and to affect two major changes in theology, uh, some of which have only recently been realized. One is she insists upon the divine dimension of creation itself. Uh, last week, I taped a program with my colleague, uh, Matthew Fox, who is champion the conception of what he calls creation theology, namely that God is involved in creation. And of course, that creation is a result of spirit or wisdom. He recently wrote a book on Hildegard for this very reason. And this idea that creation is itself to be seen as having a divine property is rooted in Hildegard's vision. And of course, the other is that this rooting of creation in the divine is specifically in the feminine aspect of the divine, in wisdom or spirit, which Hildegard understood were to be appreciated interchangeably. So that is my example of, I think, a stunning woman of faith from the medieval period. Uh, coming later, Ines Esteban is equally stunning, but 
for a distressing reason, especially as compared to Hildegard. Look at her dates. She was not yet 12 years old when she was killed by being burnt at the stake under the Spanish Inquisition. How can you have such a dreadful contrast within a few centuries in the treatment of someone who was quite clearly, as we shall see in a moment, also a visionary woman? As I mentioned earlier, the development into modernity brought with it forces which were, especially as experienced initially, often highly negative. Uh, in the case of Spain during this time, uh, 10 years prior to the birth of Inés Esteban, the Spanish Inquisition was actually developed. And it was a new form of inquisition as compared to what had happened earlier on. It was not under the direct control of Pope, nor was it under the direct control of religious authorities. Instead, the authority of the Spanish Inquisition came from Spain, which is why it's called the Spanish Inquisition. That is, Ferdinand and Isabella, yes, the same two who contracted with Christopher Columbus to make his little trip across the Atlantic, Ferdinand and Isabella, in their project of unifying Spain under royal power, their power, instead of the power of local nobility, wanted to make sure that everyone in their country was a Catholic. And as a result of that, they undertook two coordinated and very often lethal initiatives. One was to expel from the land of Spain all those who were not of the Catholic faith. That, of course, included very large numbers of Muslims, since after all, Spain had been conquered by Muslim powers during the eighth century of the Common Era, and also Jews, Jews who had already been subject to remarkable oppression under the earlier Muslim rule. So they wished to remove them from the land of Spain. One of their most important edicts, ironically, came in 1492 for the removal of both Jews and Muslims from Spain. Now, the alternative to being removed was to convert. And those Jews who converted to Catholicism by accepting baptism were known as conversos, though who, those who had converted. But as soon as they did that, there arose the suspicion. Is a given person who had converted genuine? Is this baptism undertaken in good faith? What about those who had been practicing Judaism, who accept baptism, who then, in fact, wish to continue practicing their Judaism? Why not? Why couldn't they meet on Shabbat? Why couldn't they keep kosher? Why not celebrate the festivals of Judaism? This, under the Spanish Inquisition, became a crime. And the crime was called Judaizing. And if one were accused of Judaizing, one either had to, by an act of faith, auto de fe, by an act of faith, you had to say, I will not do this again, or you could be burnt at the stake. And Ines was so burned, probably with several thousand other people uh, during the course of the Spanish Inquisition overall. When you consider some of the controversies we currently engage in, over issues of how to deal with people who are culturally 
or religiously different, I think one can recognize in the Spanish Inquisition some of those forces coming together in an especially lethal way. Because of this persecution, and because she was functionally illiterate, we don't have from Ines what we've got from Hildegard, uh, namely her own testimony of what her prophecy was. Ironically, we have her testimony from the Spanish Inquisition, because in the way of violent bureaucracy, it kept excellent records. And many of these individual cases are actually documented by several inquisitors who wrote everything down. I refer to Sharon Fay Corin, you see, in respect to both of these translations. I do so because she sat down with copies of the inquisitor's records and collated them and translated them so that one can understand what other people being subjected to this scrutiny at the same time were saying about Ines and the two concerned are named Pero Fernandez and Juan de Segovia. So in the case of Pero, he's asked, well, what was she saying? Well, we can ask the question, what was she saying when? Well, in her town, Pereira, she would typically on Shabbat enter into prophecy, explain what was about to happen. And the reason the Inquisition became so upset with Ines is that people would travel from a very considerable distance just to be with Ines on these occasions when she prophesied. And apparently it would lead to a great deal of festivity. Festivity because what she prophesied was that there was to be release for the conversals. Uh, they would no longer be persecuted. And so in the first case, we have the statement, this witness was asked, who is this Elijah and for what reason he is coming? One of the great thing about inquisitors is they're reliably stupid. I mean, that is to say, if you don't know who Elijah is, you know, you have no business inquiring into anyone's faith. But anyway, that's what we're dealing with, right? This person, whoever it was, didn't know that in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Malachi, the Elijah is supposed to come before God's vindication of the righteous. So of course there's going to be a prophecy of Elijah. And she told him that he was to want to come by God's command, preach in the world, and the conversos were to leave and were to go into some land. And this is what I find very interesting. And this confessant asked, what are there in these lands? And she was told that there were people and the sustenance of bread and fruit and all things that are needed. That somewhere the conversos would be translated in order to be safe and to be looked after. Very interestingly, there's another document, not in the Hebrew Bible, widely read uh, in ancient Judaism, known as the Book of Enoch. And Enoch has a tradition within Judaism, within Christianity, and also within Islam. And in all these cases, the idea is that Enoch has a special place in heaven, because the book of Genesis says that Enoch walked with God and he was not. And so the conception is that Enoch entered into a heavenly journey. And God showed him what was prepared for the righteous. And one of Enoch's visions, he's brought to a place where people rejoice and where the tree of life is present to give them constant fruit. And they're promised that they are going to live long life on earth, such as your fathers, that is Enoch's fathers, lived in their days. Just as Hildegard had been influenced by the wisdom of Solomon, probably in an oral form, 
because the Middle Ages was a time of oral tradition re-emerging. So Ines Esteban is influenced by the first book of Enoch. And one can see this especially in her account. This is the second case from Juan de Segovia, uh, where it refers to the nature of her visions. Her mother was already dead. Her mother died when she was very young herself, came to her and took her hand and told her not to be afraid because it was God's will that she ascend to heaven to see the secrets and to see marvelous things. And in this like manner, another man who had died a few days before took her other hand and the angel who was drawing them upward thus said that they were taking her up to heaven where she would see the souls who were suffering in purgatory. In like manner, in another place, she would see other souls in glory seated on chairs of gold. Likewise, she told me that there seemed to be another higher place above her head, where there was much murmuring, and that she asked the angel, what is that sounding above? And the angel said to her, friend of God, those who make sounds up there are those who were burned on earth and now are in glory. That is, there's not only a place of refuge for the conversos, there's specific privilege for those who are martyred as a result of their faith. This conception of the individual who's able to enter into heaven to be shown truth by God may remind you of Dante. And that would not be a surprise because Dante, like Ines Esteban, is influenced by the Jewish tradition known as the Kabbalah, known as the tradition of how this ascent to heaven can occur. There is no chance whatever that I can see that Ines Esteban ever read Dante, right? He's an Italian poet. He's basically inventing the Italian language for the first time. Uh, illiterate daughters of tanners in Spain didn't read a lot of Dante, but they were aware of the tradition of the heavenly journey, such as is related in the book of Enoch. That in its turn was something that exerted a powerful influence on Dante himself and Western tradition. I always try to remind my colleagues in English literature of this fact, but somehow they keep not getting the memo. Because Enoch reports on exactly this kind of vision and look, he said, I saw clouds. They were calling me in a vision. The fogs were calling me in the course of the stars and lightning were rushing me and causing me to desire. And in the vision, the winds were causing me to fly and rushing me high up to heaven. And then that opens uh, Enoch's tour of heaven. What's striking about Ines and people like her, of which there were many, uh, is that this visionary environment was for them much more real than what they were experiencing, even at the hands of the Inquisition. So in the case of Ines, and also in her different way, Hildegard, uh, vision is presented by these two particular women as an alternative to what is occurring at the moment, and as a way of coping on the basis of their own agency with the particular dilemmas that they had to face. What came up within their period were challenges unique to the Middle Ages and the case of Hildegard, the early modern period in the case of Ines. And yet there is a consistency in their recourse to an understanding that vision is something that can make a person who seems to be a victim into an agent that can change the very conditions in which they live. So thank you for joining me and for exploring these two figures with them, with me, both of whom 
I find to be especially interesting and in their different way inspiring. I guess I can stop sharing the screen now. That way I can see everyone better. And I assume you're opening it up for questions because- Yes, I'm happy for questions. <laughs> and I now have gallery view so I can see people. That's better, yeah. We didn't, we didn't leave you, we're still here. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Just making sure. Yes, please, Arlene. Yes, um, I can understand where, where Hildegard got her strengths uh, because she studied scripture, she knew scripture, she knew the Psalms. Uh, but I didn't hear that with Ines. I didn't hear that she, she was very, very young. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so she depended really entirely upon a vision that gave her the courage to speak out, even though the Inquisition was going on and she knew it was going on. She probably knew it would, would, what it would mean for her. So where did she get her, you know, besides her vision, you know, she didn't have a, a biblical understanding. Yeah, that's exactly right. And especially within this period, uh, we are in no position to try to suppose that someone like Ines would have any kind of rich educational background, religious or otherwise. As I mentioned, she is the daughter of a tanner. Uh, many of the people who came to her when she was engaging in prophecy uh, did so who were also tanners and other kinds of merchants. Uh, that gave them the ability to travel and to go to the place in Herrera where Ines was. Interestingly, I like the contrast you draw between uh, Ines and Hildegard. Interestingly, in both cases, the women report having visions at a very early age. Uh, Ines, because that's the only age she ever had. Uh, in the case of, of Hildegard, because even when she was well into her 70s, which counted as old at the time, even when she was well into her 70s, she would remember the kinds of visions that she used to have when she was much younger. So for both of them, the visionary experience was something that they grew comfortable with. Uh, uh, in the case of Ines, she lost her mother at a very early age, and her earliest visions were about her mother. It may be the case that because of that vision of her mother, uh, Ines came uh, to rely on that more on its own than Hildegard did. Whereas in the case of Hildegard, her parents continued to live as she developed her relationship with Juta, who lived the contemplative life with her. I think another important factor in this is the conviction of Ines that there is a way of life associated with the vision that needs to be maintained uh, and that that way of life is resisted by the powers that be in the Spain of her time. So what she told people to do in the context of her visions was to maintain the life of a conversos, which meant keeping kosher. She also insisted that they should take up fasts on uh, Mondays and Thursdays, in addition to Wednesdays and Fridays in the Catholic way. Uh, and she said that her visions were especially uh, related to the practice of fasting. And she expected them to keep uh, the Shabbat and also other major uh, festivals and fasts of Judaism. And that appears to have been what was most valuable to her. In fact, at the end of the day, 
more valuable than her own life. Uh, and that, that final statement that she makes in the testimony of Juan de Segovia of there being a special place for those who were burned, that's part of her vision, right? So she it would appear understood that this was at least a likely outcome, if not an inevitable outcome of what she was doing. So I think it, it has to do with the intensity of the vision, uh, but also the intensity of her resistance to the attempt by the authorities to wipe out the culture of the conversos. Oh, Arlene, I think has another question. I think I Doris. Do. I think Doris may have a question. Yeah, I, I was but Doris, I was waiting for her. <laughs> okay, yeah, but Doris is is muted. muted. I think. Yeah. Uh, I still show you no. muted, Doris. Well, while she's fussing with that, I'll 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 put my question out there. Okay, sure. And, and you know, I'm, I I thought of of Saint Francis of Assisi. Uh, when you were talking about Hildegard and her relationship to the creation. And I can't remember St. Francis's dates, but I'm wondering if they were close. And, and there's a real interest then in, uh, in that connection to nature, that oneness, which comes from uh, the contemplative life, you know, and, and uh, that, that, that type of, uh, of uh, spirituality. Yeah, it does appear that the Middle Ages went into a major shift in their attitude towards creation, uh, exactly during the time of Hildegard and St. Francis. Uh, and and this, this was, was finally formalized a century after the, the two of them uh, by Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Thomas Aquinas is the one who championed the use in the West of the philosophy of Aristotle. Now, shifting from Plato to Aristotle may seem to be a change that only a philosophy professor could love, but in fact, it produced profound alterations in Western culture because Aristotle gives you the, the philosophical basis for thinking science could conceivably work. You know, there's, there's a reason that science emerges out of the Middle Ages. What I always remind my students is the Middle Ages weren't dark. They really weren't dark age, ages. It's just that later historians were deaf to what they were saying. And one of the things they're saying is that the life of creation, material life, actually has a sensible enough structure that you could understand it and that you could apply logic to it and therefore begin to change your own environment. This was a profound change and resulted in the fact that for centuries, Thomas Aquinas was completely ignored. That is, he was seen as undermining Plato, putting too much value on the physical universe and therefore not as being a safe Catholic thinker. It took many centuries for him to acquire the position of preeminence that he has today. And of course, the problem with that is as soon as someone becomes preeminent, even if it's centuries after his death, people are inclined to think, oh, his teaching was always accepted. You know, whereas if you look at any of the major thinkers we'll, we are familiar with, that is not the case. But what, I, what interests me about Hildegard and St. Francis is that they show us that the change that, that Thomas Aquinas had made during the 13th century had in fact happened earlier, not in the field of philosophy, but in the field of religion. And it came about in both cases, Hildegard and Francis, uh, as a result of vision, of saying, God is embracing creation too, 
as a work of his love, not simply as a place of corruption. So thank you for that question. I, I think it, it helps us to identify one of the major contributions of the Middle Ages, uh, without which the way in which we relate to the world would not have been possible. Okay, Doris, can you get the uh, get the uh, microphone to work for you? Did you have a question? I think she said she did not. Oh, okay, okay, that's fine. Well, just to say, if anyone has trouble with the microphone, you can always use the chat function. So I can I can reply that way too. It's not a difficulty. I have another question. <laughs> sure, go right out. ahead, Arlene. They're uh, good questions. You should do. You should pose them. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I, as you were, as you were reading what she wrote about how love in the feminine form is behaving like a father would the inheritance for the son. So I see her almost like equalizing the the, the feminine and the masculine here which to me is remarkable at that time uh, because women had no place. Uh, and, and so here she was talking about, you know, the divine in a, in, a, in, a, in a feminine form, female, taking care of all of the creation uh, as, 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 an inherit, as inheritance, uh, a father would for the son. So I, I thought that was just interesting uh, from a feminist perspective. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think in many ways, Hildegard uh, focuses on materials already present to some extent in the Hebrew Bible, especially the book of Proverbs, but then especially, as I say, in the wisdom of Solomon, where everything becomes uh, spelled out uh, and applies it in particular to the natural world, uh, as we were just saying, and in a fashion where there is a symmetry I think her, her interest in the symmetries between masculine and feminine in nature, since she was a botanist, was then transferred to her interest in that kind of, of symmetry among human beings. And she also sees, and this is unusual for thinkers after Augustine, uh, she also sees procreation as basically being a good thing. Uh, and you notice that when she thinks of creation, uh, she refers to all species, creatures, all creatures in every species and form acknowledge their creator. That in the very form of life, there is an acknowledgement and celebration of the divine design of the creation overall. I have a question about Inez. Sure. Um, and I don't know if this one is knowable, but I'm struck by the age of 12 as being a, a girl on the cusp of womanhood. And I was wondering if it was that potential threat that would make her more subject to the Inquisition's powers needing to basically get rid of her before she was an adult? Or was she just carried up in, you know, the enormity of the situation, as you said, you know, many, I mean, she was certainly not alone in being burned at the stake. Um, as I say, I don't know if that's, that's knowable, but I was wondering if that, you know, if, if her girlhood made her something that had to be contained before she crossed over into womanhood? Yeah, this is a, a very good question. Uh, reflecting on the motivations of the inquisitors, uh, especially when we bear in mind the issues of state, which are causing Ferdinand and Isabella to make the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, 
I don't think anyone's going to make an argument for the Spanish Inquisition, but you can nonetheless understand what their political motives are. You know, they, they, are they are after a unified country. They think to be a unified country, you basically have to have one religion. We would disagree with that, but within Europe, this was scarcely unusual, right? At the time that the, the Spanish exiled the Jews, the English and the French had already done it. Uh, so it was one of the features of the rise of nationalism, which shows up persistently, uh, namely a desire to remove the other from the society, allegedly to make it stronger. Often this would focus on practitioners of Judaism. In the case of Spain, it's not surprising that it also involved practitioners of Islam, since Islam had been on the ground for several centuries. But even when one looks at that motivation uh, behind the, the Inquisition, that you then have to ask, all right, once you've done that, why do you care really? If you force someone to be baptized, basically, why do you care if these conversos uh, practice Judaism alongside their recognition of Catholicism? I mean, what, what causes you to delve into the question of individual motivation. And here I think what we see is a very early trait of police states generally, namely that having identified a given enemy, uh, it then becomes all the more suspicious that that enemy lurks in places where it really has to scratch hard in order to find them. Uh, so I think that that is the, the, the second step of the motivation of the Inquisition. But Ines's case is different from that too, precisely because of what you say, precisely because of her age. She doesn't make it to the age of 12. You know, how sneaky can she really be? Answer, she's not sneaky at all. I mean, she, she is practicing her visions openly. She's being recognized as a prophet openly by the people who come to see her, which means that she is also quickening the sense among the conversos that there is something to be done to handle this situation and for them to insist upon their identity. That opening vision she has of a place for the conversos is something that I think at a resonance, which is why people come. And apparently when people came to her, they tended to bring their own children because she was a child. So that these celebrations of the Shabbat were extraordinarily festive. I suggest that's what drove the authorities crazy. That it's the sense of ebullience, of enjoyment, of the celebration beforehand of a victory which you think is coming because it's authorized by a vision is seen by the authorities as being an alternative to the Spanish national project and therefore something that has to be put down. Uh, during this time, there was within Spain in particular, it was not particularly strong elsewhere in Europe, but it was in Spain. Uh, there was a ferment about the year 1500. The idea was, well, it's 1,000 years plus 500 years, 1,000 years and a half from the opening of the current era. Surely something is going to break through during this time. And the Spanish monarchy of Ferdinand and Isabella, and later uh, saw what they were doing as part of the Messianic project. Why do you think they were messing about in North America? The idea was that the extension of the Spanish monarchy into North America, which was extraordinarily successful in military terms, uh, was held to be 
one of the proofs that Spain was going to occupy a messianic leadership. Uh, it's, it's the same attitude uh, that later on in the 16th century, later on in the 16th century led Spain to go to war against the Ottoman fleet uh, to take over the Mediterranean on behalf of Spain because Spain was to be a world empire. And of course that was so successful that they just knew that they could also defeat those ridiculous heretical English. And they sent their armada to do that. They would have succeeded except, oops, it was the English channel. And sure enough, their ships weren't ready for it. So this is a very large nationalistic project that the Spanish Inquisition was a part of. And uh, most observers in the period after Inez, most observers thought of the Spanish empire as being invincible. Uh, no, no one thought that the Dutch and the English, the Danish would ever be competitors. I am again. <laughs> okay. I, I keep thinking of the parallels with what's going on today in this country. Uh, I just keep thinking how there's, this is not anything new. This is just ancient history <laughs> repeating itself. And we don't know that history. Uh, I've been reading uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast. And I kept thinking that this is, I can just see so many par parallels there with expelling Muslims, expelling Jews who were different. They want them on the bottom of the ladder. Uh, we're on the top and we're in the power. Uh, and all of that is still, is still with us. And, but to see it even in these ancient days, incredible, incredible. Yeah, you no, know, I think without question, it is, it is striking. And the question it raises in my mind is, to what extent is the national project, like the unified Spain, you know, uh, the unified France, the unified England from which Jews had already been expelled. To what extent is the nationalistic project at the end of the day incompatible with the demands of justice? And in a way that is what the visions of the sort of Ines Esteban is, a marker of. Uh, I think it's also something that is comparable to the way in which a liberation theology has emerged uh, in the United States during the 19th and 20th centuries. I mean, if, if you look at uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, you know, the I Have a Dream speech is in a certain idiom, an example of religious vision, of, of the necessity of establishing an alternative reality which has a greater moral force than what's being inflicted on the ground. Any last questions? We don't want to mute anybody. Exactly. I'm keeping an eye, eye an eye on chat too. Just to make sure. Well, the good news is, if you do have a question, we're going to be meeting again next month. <laughs> good segue. Nicely we, done. Thank you so much. Um, so as we don't see any last questions for now, um, I would, I think it's a, is it a good time to thank everybody for coming and- uh, Sounds good. Okay, wonderful. And um, thank you, Dr. Bruce Chilton for again, enlightening us and uh, feeding our souls. Um, always, always, I always learn something new and different. It's funny when you were talking about uh, Elijah, Passover's coming, 
and the new thing going around uh, the internet now is, you know, it's come to this where somebody, you see a door open, you just see the mask, like, cause you know, it's like Elijah's wearing a mask. <laughs> so um, yes, but anyway, um, so mark on your calendars now, everybody, Sunday, April 18. Uh, 18 is always a good number high, uh, where we're gonna do the early modern period with Francesa Sara of Safed, whether I said that in Iona, and Teresa of Avia. So we will, we will start early modern period, but uh, more closely related as in this week, uh, if we remember last month, we talked about our Pack a Purse Mitzvah Now project. I think we have collected close to 75 purses, which is wonderfully overwhelmingly uh, mm. supportive. If we, if anybody has some toiletries uh, that still want to be donated, thank you, Marion. Um, we, we still want to pack some more stuff in those purses. So uh, that's for this week till the 24th. And on the 25th, we are having, uh, the Jewish Federation is having our movie night in. It's an interactive movie night in with uh, Roger Sherman, <laughs> winning director and producer. And uh, he has, one of his movies is uh, In Search of Israeli Cuisine. And what he does is he's gonna take these different um, components of video and share them and then ask, we can ask questions, he'll ask us questions. So it's gonna be something, something more like this, something much more interactive than our traditional movie night. So why is this movie different than all other movies? <laughs> <laughs> Because and, it's uh, not it's not with Stanley Tucci. That's it's why. It's not with. Uh, yeah, no, that's a good one. Um, so yes, we that with the I don't know I don't know about anybody else, but I'm already starting in a positive way to stress about Passover and just the amount of yeah. cooking and cleaning. So make sure you take a break from that stress and come join us for our movie night in. Um, but we thank you all for joining us today, and uh, we will send the recording for those of you who would like. Uh, for those of you who wouldn't like, you're going to get it as well. <laughs> but we're happy that you're here with us. And on that, I think, uh, thank you, Pastor Luis Perez, again, and the Rhinebeck Reform Church for this wonderful collaboration with the Jewish Federation and Bard College and the IAT. Um, really a, a, good, a good solidarity and, 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 a, and a good community that I feel we're building in Dutchess, uh, Dutchess County. So thank you all. Have a wonderful, blessed Sunday, a good week. Chag Pesach Sameach. And we will see you next month, if not sooner. Thank you all thank for you joining so us. Take care. We'll see you. Thank you. Bye-bye.